Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the 1001 Movies Podcast. This time I'll be talking about Jean Cocteau's 1946 fantasy, Beauty and the Beast. The moment the first reel of Beauty and the Beast starts rolling, Cocteau makes no qualms about pulling the audience aside and reminding us, via a written prologue, that what we are about to view is a fairy tale, and one that was written primarily for children. This is true, but an hour later we realize that this is not just a fairy tale, but a story about sex, marriage, and, at the end, the realization that living happily ever after may not be all that it's cracked up to be. French director Jean Cocteau had established himself as a poet, novelist, and graphic designer in the 1920s and 30s. He is now known by many as one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. Prior to Beauty and the Beast, he had worked on a small handful of films, most notably The Blood of a Poet in 1932, which was received pretty much how Cocteau intended it, an arthouse film about an artist. After the war, French filmmakers found themselves back to square one after the German occupation with its strict censorship and propaganda, and Cocteau wanted to make a film that could be enjoyed by most moviegoers, unlike his previous films. At the same time, he wanted to make a film that was as artistic as The Blood of a Poet, and would employ a French cast and crew, most of whom found themselves searching for work in the post-war environment. Beauty and the Beast is based on the story by Jean-Marie Le Prince de Beaumont, and the most popular rendition is probably the 1991 Disney film. Cocteau's version is more loyal to the original, and indeed many elements created for the 1946 film are used by the Disney film. The plot is quite simple. Belle lives with her sisters and merchant father in a modest cottage in the countryside. When Belle's father gets lost in the woods, he encounters a magical castle and tries to pick a rose for his daughter Belle. He is encountered by the Beast, who demands that, as payment for stealing the rose, he or one of his daughters must remain at the castle. Belle insists on going and is given every luxury while staying with the Beast. Every evening at 7 o'clock, the Beast asks her to marry him, and, although she initially refuses, she soon grows fond of him, and he allows her to leave for a short time to visit her ill father. Later, tempted by the stories of the riches at the Beast's castle, Belle's brother and her vain suitor Avignon raid the castle. The Beast, meanwhile, is dying of a broken heart at being, after being left by Belle, and as Avignon plunges to his death from atop a wall, the Beast transforms into handsome Prince Charming, and Avignon's corpse turns into the Beast. Cocteau changes this otherwise simple story into a visual feast. Like Lucino Visconti in Senso, Cocteau drew inspiration from paintings and told his cinematographer to light Belle's family's cottage like a work by Vermeer. The Beast's Castle, however, is a surrealist wet dream. The candle operas do not simply hang on the wall, but are held ensconced by human hands and arms which project from the walls and move with the castle's occupants. The statues that pepper the interior have eyes that follow Belle about, and meals are served by a hand jutting from the dining table. Despite all of this, the interior of the castle is surprisingly bare, not unlike an unfinished stage play. The reasons for the enchanted castle are never explained, but it's clear that the Beast's castle exists in an alternate world of fairy tales. Roger Ebert wrote that during Belle's first dinner at the castle, as the Beast approaches her from behind, she seems to be writhing in orgasmic ecstasy. Well, I do not agree that Belle's attraction to the Beast begins that early in the film. It's clear to a careful viewer that later in the story, the two of them form an almost sadomasochistic bond. Aside from one moment when he carries her unconscious body to her bed, the Beast never enters Belle's bedroom. In one scene, however, having returned from hunting, his hands literally steaming from the kill, the Beast seems to be in a state of sexual arousal. He sees Belle emerge from her bedroom and demands that she shut the door and leave him alone. This is not merely an act of chivalry, 
of a gentleman politely refusing to intrude upon a lady's abode, but the reaction of a man who knows that his bestial nature may force him to do something he may later regret, namely force himself upon Bell. Later, when the beast is thirsty, Bell cups her hands in water and permits him to drink from her hands. There is something oddly sexually submissive about this image, and it seems to be the moment when Belle learns she can get anything from her suitor, and not just an elegant bedroom and clothes to wear. In the Disney film, Belle is given a gigantic library to satisfy her urge to read. She is a postmodern picture of the liberated feminist. Not so much for Cocteau's version of Belle. She exists as the beast's muse and seems to be part of the tableau of the castle. Cocteau's beast is a tragic figure, not unlike King Kong or Frankenstein's monster. The moral of the story, of course, is that we should not judge people by their appearances, as even the ugliest monster could belie a handsome prince inside. Madame de Beaumont's original story was about arranged marriages, and how an otherwise emasculated wife could learn to love even the ugliest husband. Cocteau, however, wanted a different moral in his story. At the conclusion... When the beast transforms into a handsome prince, Belle seems disappointed, and she explains that she preferred the beast that she grew to love. This is further emphasized by the fact that the prince is played by Jean Moray, who also plays Belle's greedy and evil suitor, Avignon. Uh, and Moray, who was Cocteau's lover, also played the beast underneath the mask. Cocteau's m moral seems to be that beauty is not everything. And enlightenment may be found and enjoyed by existing as an unattractive and tortured individual rather than a spoiled, entitled brat. This is, at the end, the Beast's film, unlike the Disney movie. Cocteau was plagued with a variety of illnesses during the making of the film, and he later proudly proclaimed that he suffered for his art. The film was a critical success upon its release, and enjoyed a resurgence when composer Philip Glass wrote an opera that could be performed simultaneously with watching the film. This version is available on the Criterion Collection's DVD release. What did I think of it? While it lacks the Hollywood grandstanding of, say, Wizard, The Wizard of Oz, Beauty and the Beast is a pinnacle in the fantasy genre. Frankly, I found it rather haunting. The surreal interior of the Beast's castle is amazing, and the mask worn by the actor is stunning. I could see young children being frightened out of their wits with some of these visuals. The living statues in particular are memorable. My introduction to this story, like most people, was the Disney movie, and it was refreshing to see a children's story being told in such an adult manner. Cocteau's visuals, however, remain the high point. After all, we're pretty familiar with the story already, aren't we? That's all I have to say about Beauty and the Beast. I will be taking a week off, but join me next time as I talk about Quentin Tarantino's breakthrough 1992 film, Reservoir Dogs. Also, feel free to email me any questions or comments at 1001moviespodcast at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter via at 1001moviespc and check out the Facebook page. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave some positive feedback on iTunes. See you next time.